In this new series of rambles, I've taken to the footpaths of our county to meet new people and explore the heritage of our special region. In this first episode, I'm in a market town famous for its antiques and one time its horse fair that dated back to the 13th century. So let's go explore Horncastle. Entering Horncastle makes you feel like you've stepped back in time. The market town has kept its charm and it's full of antique shops. Called Banavallum by the Romans, it was seen as a defensive settlement, sited on the angle of the rivers Bain and Waring. Parts of the Roman walls can still be seen today as you wander around the town. In fact, if you enter the library, you're met with a large chunk of the wall. Horncastle means the Roman town by a horn-shaped piece of land, and it comes from the old English word horner, which, bizarrely enough, means a horn-shaped piece of land, especially one formed by a river bend. There are many pubs in the town, and the area known as the Bull Rink was the terminus for the passenger coaches. Two old posting inns are still standing, and they're the Red Lion and the Bull Hotel. As we head down to the River Bain, we can see how the river was used. Stevenson's water mill with the outline of its wheel still stands, but today this area is frequented by people feeding the ducks but in the 19th century was the place used for baptisms. Horncastle's most famous resident was of course Sir Joseph Banks, botanist and president of the Royal Society. Born in 1743 in London, he accompanied Captain Cook on his voyages around the globe. Aged 21, he inherited the family's estate at Reevesby Abbey in Lincolnshire. He also had a house here in the town, marked by a blue plaque, and it stands in the street named after him. The Sir Joseph Banks Centre is a good place to visit if you want to learn more about the man. And I'm here to meet with Jean Burton, Vice Chairman of the Sir Joseph Banks Society. So I'm here with Jean Burton, who's the Vice Chairman of the Sir Joseph Banks Society. Jean, we're here in Horncastle today. What is his connection with the town? Well, his connection in the town is that his great-grandfather bought land in Lincolnshire. And in about 1714, he bought the estate of Reevesby, right. which includes land and the village mm -hmm. of Reevesby. And, um, he spent his childhood there. So he spent a lot of time outside of London in the countryside. Do you think this is where his love of plants came from? Well, my personal view is yes, because he wasn't an academic child. Mm -hmm. He was a very healthy, robust little boy. And right. he spent most of his childhood roaming around the estate with, with children from the villages. Mm -hmm. it, it was a very carefree childhood. Yeah. And you've got to remember the area that he lived in at that time was on the edge of the fence so he had a whole water world in front of him and he yes. would go boating and he loved fishing so he was definitely an outdoor boy and yes I think that did engender a lot of his interest in nature and freedom. Now you've written a book about Banks, just tell us a little bit about his connection on the botanical side and some of the adventures that he actually went on. His first journey abroad was to um, a Labrador. He went on a fishing vessel to Labrador and um, came back with all sorts of samples and minerals. But he wasn't just interested in botany, he actually recorded lifestyles and he used right. to collect clothing and the plants that the clothing were made for, oh. from and, and brought those yeah. back for study. But the really important journey was the one that happened um, with Captain Cook. Mm -hmm. an HMS endeavour. Yes. Um, he literally went round the world. Um, 
I equate it to the spaceships of the 1700s. Yes. They literally went into uncharted waters. Now we quite clearly had lots of adventures and had no idea what he was going into. But it was clearly quite vital that he learned about the plants and their uses. He viewed plants in two ways. There was the ornamental value, mm -hmm. um, there was the experimentation that you go through to nurture exotic plants yeah. because clearly they, they, they're not the ordinary things we yes, find here, yeah. they needed special treatment. So it was an educational program all the way through. But one of his own concerns was the fact that um, we quite regularly across the world went through periods of food shortages mm -hmm. and very, very serious food shortages. And he believed, and probably was one of the first people to, to really concentrate on this, yeah. is that you, could you harness nature? Could you improve right. nature? Yeah. And we've got to remember back then that nature was God's creation mm. and you couldn't interfere with it. Yes. It is what it was. Um, but he challenged that. And for instance, he was a great proponent of um, grafting plants, right, yes. wild plants onto yeah. to rootstocks and crossbreeding. So it's obvious he's a really interesting character and he's done so much, but one thing from looking at the displays here, it's quite evident that Australia really embraced him, didn't they? Yes, there's a, there's a very strong connection actually with, Lincolnshire has a strong connection with um, Australia, not just because he was on the Endeavour and he explored Australia, um, he, he, he was the person who actually suggested that convicts should be sent to Australia right. after the independent mm -hmm. um, war in uh, America. Yeah. They refused to take convicts and conditions here were getting really serious and suggested, said, well, why, why not Australia? And eventually that happened. But he kept a close contact, he kept an eye on what was going on. Right. Even to the point, I mean, there used to be long letters coming from the governors of Australia to Sir Joseph, and he would use his influence and his uh, power mm -hmm. to actually try and improve conditions in Australia. So he right. was the ambassador of Australia in England, yeah. and played a really big role in improving conditions over there. And just, well, I have to mention what I hear at the um, centre, outside there, you've got a yeah. fantastic tribute garden to him. Yes, we wanted the garden to actually reflect what he did. The vast majority of the plants here have a direct connection with Sir Joseph. They're either examples of plants that he saw on his journey on Endeavour, or they are plants that were collected by plant collectors that Sir Joseph sponsored. Right. Obviously we haven't got any exotics, can't no, do that in this no. country. Everybody knows a hydrangea, but it comes from China and Sir Joseph um, arranged for that to, to be brought back to Kew where wow. it was nurtured and it now grows in our gardens. You will find a lot of common plants here. I mean our gardens just wouldn't be the same if Without. it wasn't for Sir Joseph and the plant collectors that followed. Big, well this is it, yeah. big influence wasn't he, in, in like you yes. say, English gardens, pride and joy of people. Absolutely, but, it is but they're all foreign plants. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and down to this one chap who has that connection with Lincolnshire. Exactly. And they, absolutely yes. amazing. Well thank you so much for talking to us. I'm off now to explore the canal, which of course he had an influence in he bringing certainly did. to here as well. So thank yes. you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> Banks also supported the building of the Horncastle Canal, which opened in 1802 and helped the town to prosper before the arrival of the railway. The canal cost £45,000 to build and is 11 miles long, running all the way to Tattershall. Its main commerce was coal, lime and farm produce, but it closed in 1889. Horncastle has certainly been a very prosperous place and benefited from its links with Sir Joseph Banks. In 
the centre of the marketplace stands the Stanhope Memorial, erected in 1894 to commemorate Edward Stanhope. He was Lord of the Manor, local MP for Horncastle and a local benefactor. One of his contributions to the town was the clearance of the old buildings in 1890 to improve the town's market. The buildings within this area are a mix of Georgian and Victorian architecture and certainly show the town's wealth and prosperity. Horncastle is famous for its annual horse fair which attracted buyers from around Europe. It first got its charter in 1229 and the prices here were used as a guide for the rest of the country. The fair, which could last a fortnight, saw many Lincolnshire folk breeding horses, the main breed being the Lincolnshire Black, which was used mainly for ploughing and pulling. For years, the army also used the fair as a means of buying horses for its campaigns, particularly for the Crimean War in the 1850s. The horse fair sadly came to an end in 1948. Standing near the church are two cottages dating from the 18th century. They originally housed the county's first dispensary and the town's workhouse. Dating from the 13th century, St Mary's Church is built from the local green sandstone, but like many churches, it was rebuilt in the Victorian age. Inside are many memorials to Horncastle's great and good and its inclusion in many notable historical events. Hung over an archway are 13 scythes, which are allegedly from the Civil War, the Battle of Winsby having been fought nearby in 1643. Though some believe they may have come from the Lincolnshire Rebellion in 1536. Whatever their connection, they add to the town's rich and interesting heritage. Behind me above the font is a memorial to Sir Ingram Hopton. At the Battle of Winsby, it's said he unseated Oliver Cromwell, but was himself killed and is buried here. After the restoration, the catrafull was placed in the church, and on it, Oliver Cromwell is described as the arch rebel. Though local folklore says that the Lord Protector himself personally ensured that Hopton received the burial he deserved for bravery on the battlefield. Outside of the main door, among the shadows, lie the grave of Dr John Fawcett and his family, interred where only outcasts were buried. The idea of this so repelled him, he ensured that he was buried amongst those less fortunate than himself. Horncastle has certainly been a prosperous place and benefited from its links with Sir Joseph Banks. Well, from here to my next destination, which was once home to a poet laureate, arguably one of the country's most popular poets. We're off to Somersby. Lincolnshire has had its fair share of famous people who have come and gone, but there's probably nobody more famous than the poet laureate Alfred Lord Tennyson, born in 1809. Somersby was home to the young Alfred, whose father George Clayton Tennyson was rector here and at neighbouring Bag Enderby from 1806 to 1837. The family lived here at Summersby House and when they first arrived there was only one child but Dr Tennyson had big plans and began to expand the property which was a good job because they went from one to eleven in a matter of twelve years. The Tennyson children spent many years playing in the area and enjoyed bathing in the local brook and their imagination was stimulated by the beautiful sounding fairy wood which lay between Harrington and Bagenderby. 
Within Summersby stands St Margaret's Church, which in Tennyson's day had a thatched roof and was restored in the Victorian period. Over the south door is a sundial and in the churchyard stands a 15th century cross. Just over there is Holy Well Wood and in it is a spring which the Tennyson children are said to have spent many hours bathing in and playing around there. We can't actually get access into the wood but there's also a stone there which is known locally as Tennyson's Seat. It's not known whether any of these Lincolnshire landmarks inspired Tennyson in his writing but I have a feeling they probably did. In nearby Tetford stands the White Hart Inn, once a meeting place of the Tetford Club for local gentry, of which poet laureate Alfred Tennyson was a member. Other notable visitors are said to have been Dr Samuel Johnson, the author who was recognised as one of the great critics of English literature. Here you'll also find Tennyson Settle, which is a good place to sit and rest by the fire after a long day's rambling. From here, our journey takes us across the walls to a village with a Norwegian connection. The villages on my next rambles are three tiny hamlets, which are again evidence of the population decline in the county since medieval times. The first hamlet is said to have the smallest church in Lincolnshire and was mentioned in Doomsday, and there are also stories of a wild man in the wood. Rookland is six miles from Louth and its tiny church is dedicated to St Olaf, a northern saint who died around 1030. It can only seat 40 people and the present building was built in 1885 of sandstone. There's been a church on this site since at least doomsday. The connection between the chapel and the Norwegian saint, according to Stretfield in his book Lincolnshire and the Danes, shows a clear connection with the invaders. For Rook, R-U-C-K, is a corruption of the old Norse word hurok, meaning the bird, a rook. haunting the woods around Rookland is a haunting figure called the Shag Boy, sometimes known as the Shag Foal. And according to Lincolnshire folklore, it's a ghost-like animal. Well, the only animals I've seen so far, fingers crossed, are the sheep over in the field. Nearby are the hamlets of Farforth and Maidenwell, at one time on the route from Louth to Horncastle. St Peter's Church in Farforth is Grade 2 listed and was rebuilt like so many in the Victorian age, using stone from a previous medieval church. Maidenwell, as its name suggests, was the site of a spring. These wells were visited by maidens and were usually renowned for their curative powers. The village and church no longer stand and for many years the area was a commercial rabbit warren. Maidenwell has a connection with Bonnie Prince Charlie who's said to have stayed here in the 1740s on his way to Lincoln. Now in an attempt to possibly blacken the name of a Catholic supporter, a local man's coffin was exhumed to ensure that he had actually died and not faked his own death and run off to France to join the young pretender. This part of the walls is well worth exploring, so until next time. Happy rambling!